So, um, so what, what did you do before, um, before you got into the wine business? What, what, what's your background? My background is basically geek. I, uh, I began, and, and I think my general sensibilities are kind of left brain. It's definitely technical. I've got a degree in chemistry from the university, and most of my most of the money I've earned in my life has come from that side of things. Uh, at the same time, uh, the majority uh, doesn't necessarily equate to everything that I think about. Uh, my, I got a second degree while I was graduating from the university in English. So I was going left brain, right brain, and I've basically continued that same way all my life. Left brain, right brain. So, um, what what did what did you do kind of before you got into the wine industry? That um, was there sort of a path that you followed, or um, you know, how did you get from that technical side into the winemaking side? My path to where I am now was one going from uh, investigating something that I knew nothing about. I grew up in the southeast, uh, in North Carolina, in fairly traditional Bible Belt sort of area. First drop of alcohol that I had crossed my lips was when I was a senior in college. I mean, not even a beer prior to that. So I had a lot of making up to do, which I have done. Um, so right out of college, I started investigating things that cropped up in great, uh, great novels, this whole idea of wine and its ability to translate over years and uh, to uh, embody a certain terroir or a certain, certain region and a certain sensibility I thought was interesting. And then I became totally captivated by it when I started looking at some of the complexities of wine. So from that point on, uh, I was into wine. It then just translated to getting more and more involved from an avid consumer to someone building a huge wine cellar of our own to uh, coming and into an area like Oregon that, unbeknownst to me, was beginning a wine industry at the time and saying, okay, hey, I grew up on a farm, I'm agricultural. I'm a chemist, I know that technical side of things, and I love wine for all of the, all of the reasons from complexity, learning every year, to almost the immortal aspect of things. I, it sounds corny, but wine is one of the few things you can do that'll live after you. And so I many times now joke with my daughter when we have a great vintage and of course have wines that are truly ageable like Pinots or Riesling. I joke with her that on my deathbed I'll be asking her to bring the 2011 Corral Creek Riesling to see if it's finally ready or if it's uh, lived up to its potential and that'll be 35 years from now. So, 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 th so those are some of the com things that drove me this way. Along the way, technical issues have always been of great interest to me and technical rigor is one half of the equation that many times people in the wine business especially those people outside of the wine business just barely creeping into it that they dismiss science uh, is critical to not relying on a single serendipitous vintage or winemaking effort that makes a very good wine. In order to make a very good wine every year, you have to translate it from the right brain creative side to the left brain uh, technical rigor side. And that's one of the reasons I love the fact that I'm balanced right brain, left brain. I can enjoy and exult over the, the fact that uh, hedonistically wine is exceptional and we can be creative, we can make things that have never happened before, but once we've 
decided that this is something we want every year, it takes the technical to be able to implement that. Do you um, recall kind of discovering wine kind of in, in literature? Do you recall any specifics from that or any things that you read that really kind of make you raise your eyebrows or anything like that? That um, in the in in literature, I uh, during that phase of my life. Um, when I began to get interested. It was, of course, European-based, and there were a lot of novels like uh, Somerset Mom's Razor's Edge, and, uh, uh, some novels like that that carried someone escaping and going to a region and understanding what it was all about, and wine was usually a part of that. So I'd have to actually look up passages, which I haven't done for decades. And when you came to Oregon, was that for a job uh, that you had at the time, or...? Yeah, with, with my uh, somewhat schizophrenic right brain, left brain thing, I worked technical, technical work uh, in high-tech industry, um, uh, initially straight out of university, uh, in chemistry, uh, the engineering side, in manufacturing industry, high-tech manufacturing. And although that was very interesting in retrospect, at the time I was uh, naive enough to think that there were high levels of standards uh, as an adult that were different than they were as a high school student or a college student. And I, I was a little disenchanted with the workday world. So I took my savings and decided to write the great American novel. That got me here to the Northwest. I rented a cabin for a year, uh, spent my savings, did a lot of writing, realized that I was just as naive to, uh, to think that it was easy to submit and get rejected from magazines or from publishers. Uh, and I also found out that I couldn't take that sort of rejection at that age. I can take it now. I've had plenty of examples of it since then. And that, uh, that left me here in the Northwest, went back to the same sort of, of work in technical manufacturing. And actually some of the tools and some of the skills that I was working with in that high-tech business became very helpful in the winemaking uh, elucidating the winemaking process and what the variables were that were critical to making great wines um, here in an unknown area, at least unknown to me, and pretty much unknown to most people. This was like the uh, early 80s. Now, um, was there a certain moment when you thought, hey, I can, I can get into this the wine industry, or was there kind of anything that you remember that where you thought, hey, okay, this is this is something I'm going to try and do? Do you uh, recall anything specific? I, I recall recall the late '70s. In the late '70s, the the wine business here had one or two uh, small blips of notoriety, and it was very interesting. I I was collecting a lot of. Uh, European and especially California um, Bordelais varieties at that time and so I was interested in wine and then I discovered that uh, we were trying to make Pinot Noir here of a world-class nature and there were one or two blips that said we can do it and so it was in the 70s I, I can remember sitting back and saying okay I don't have much going on here I've got a young family two kids uh, uh, my wife, uh, we were uh, both working jobs together. We were both interested in wine. It was one of the things that dragged us together initially was uh, an interest in the consuming and appreciating side. And I was bored. I only had small family that we were raising. I had a full-time technical job where I was going up pretty quickly. It was beginning to expand what's a very successful company today. And I said, I'm bored. I don't have enough going on. So I said, how about starting a vineyard and then 
extrapolating that 10 to 15 years in the future and having a successful winery. Did As I mentioned earlier, uh, I was raised on a farm, so the ag part of things to some people who might be uh, city people and interested in wine but not having that background, that was an advantage. Being a chemist, I knew technically what needed to happen and that was a great benefit and all I had to do was start doing it. That's when the financial part came in and that's one thing that I think especially small winemakers, uh, small winery owners uh, many times of course grapple with is what small business owners grapple with is having the capital to do it right and this is a very capital intensive business. You begin right now all of our vineyards are uh, are ours. Every wine that we make is estate grown, so we've got a lot of money kind of buried in the ground out there. It's uh, it's necessary to have the capital to do it there, and then when you look a wine, around a winery like this, you see a lot of shiny stainless steel that equates to dollars and a lot of high-tech equipment. Did you know at that time when you were just starting out, did you have any idea of the scale and scope of what it would take? Um, or did you uh, kind of underestimate things at all at that point? Um, it's a very good question. I, I think what's happened happens in, the, in an industry like ours is that we know what it's going to take, but we trust things will turn out perfectly and they never really do. I think you always know you're going to be undercapitalized in a small business. With the industry as um, collaborative as it is here in Oregon, there was a lot of work that was done ahead of time. I was maybe in the second wave of people in to the industry, or maybe in wave six or seven right now. And the people in wave one did a great job in laying down some of the, some of the ground rules and some of the initial knowledge that was critical to people like myself coming in, including in, in that pro formas of what it was going to take to do everything you needed to do to grow vineyards and to make wine. Uh, it was pretty accurate, but I was also I suppose my pessimistic side was pretty right on saying that we aren't going to have enough capital to do it. We even went so far as to go to friends and also acquaintances who had just said, boy, I'd really love to be in the line business, but I just don't have the time. So I waltzed up to 35 to 40 of them and said, you don't have the time, but you do have some money. You want to get involved. And so we gave them this uh, out-of-pocket experience to, uh, to be in the wine business and we we bring them in at critical times each year to show them what was going on uh, so we had a limited partnership from almost day one from the mid 80s on for about 15 years we've just recently dissolved that but they were very helpful in getting things up and going for us and while you were starting out, you're still uh, kind of working uh, in consulting uh, a good percentage of the time, too. So um, for 15, 16 years that... I, I began my first vineyard in 1980, purchasing the land that year, and then began, uh, began to plant it within the next year and a half after getting the, the vines together. From that point on, I... Uh, worked the vineyard, also did uh, e experiments to understand what it would take to make great Pinot Noir. That's where my technical background came in handy uh, because what I was doing in high-tech industry was using statistically designed experiments and statistical process control to elucidate and then control processes, find out which variables were the critical ones. So I just took what I was doing there, put it into experimental wine making, and uh, I think almost all of the variables that we now tightly control or decide not to control came from those initial experiments in the mid-80s. I even have uh, one or two 
very good friends who are in academia teaching from textbooks that they wrote where they included data sets from some of my initial experiments uh, to show how experimental design can be used in uh, an industry like the wine, wine business. Uh, I was technical there. I continued to work in that same field and work uh, managing engineers and technical people. And in the, in, the, in the early 90s, needed a little bit more time than I had, so resigned from full-time work, but at the same time kept going with consulting, which brought in more dollars with less time invested, and also teaching some courses at uh, uh, in local universities. So I was in Corvallis or Portland doing work uh, at that time, which was not unusual. People like Dick Ponzi taught forever, um, even though he had uh, winemaking going on. People like Hal Medici, all of those people were teachers also. Do you, um, so at what point did your, uh, the wine business become sustainable to where you didn't need to go outside anymore? The wine business became sustainable probably in the in the mid 90s for me, 95, 96, 97. Part of that was putting together capital enough to do it full time. And, uh, and part of that came about because the industry finally became mature enough and appreciated enough to where banks would lend money. You wouldn't have to go outside and uh, get it from either your savings accounts if you still had it. Uh, or from friends. So banks helped somewhat then and we also got to the point where uh, wine was being appreciated out in the marketplace and prices were adequate to support some people in the wine room. So 95 I, I began to uh, lighten my load rather than working two and a half jobs kind of narrow it down to one big job 96 was my last consulting and, uh, and teaching gig and that, uh, uh, that also came at a time when there were other changes personally for me and it was uh, a good time to make the break and only go to the winery. So it, uh, my salary has suffered over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so but uh, not my enjoyment. Was there a point in, you know, getting to that period where uh, you could kind of reproduce your labors in, just in the wine industry and, and um, where you, were, you thought, okay, um, I might have to get out if things don't work good, this is not going well, or were there really kind of tough situations that you faced where um, you, you thought you might have to throw in the towel? I have never considered throwing in the towel on, on what we do. This is too, this, this is too classically, I'm not sure how to, how to answer that except no. Never considered throwing in the towel. There are definitely tough times in the business there are vintages where instead of getting adequate uh, yield off your vineyard you get a very concentrated yield and it means fantastic quality but it also means that the bank and your accountant are saying what's going on here and so you essentially try to play forward and say we're going to make up for this because of a greater reputation and that normally has continued to work in Oregon's favor. Over the years we do learn how to how to even things out I think a little bit more. We were more at the mercy of Mother Nature at the beginning. Now I think Mother Nature we know what the range is of what she can do to us and we know how to mitigate that. We always drop crop uh, so that we don't have wild swings of too much crop, too little crop. We even it out over time. 
And we also learn how to adapt in the winery. We know what we do in a year that's rainy or late. We know what to do in a hot year. And uh, so I, I think the industry's become more mature. The vines have become more mature. The winemakers have become more mature. This gray hair is worth something and it's basically that we have experience um, somehow underneath the roots of the gray hair and that helps us. So you're very involved with things like Pinot Camp and there's a Riesling bo board and uh, just it seems like there's a long list of ways that you're involved with the wine community. Why do you think it's important and, and why are you so engaged with the... I think that's a, a good question. People here in Oregon work well together. People here in Oregon also realize that there is a contribution to the greater good that we're all required to give. If you receive help, you need to be willing to give help. And I think almost everybody here in the industry, there are one or two glaring exceptions, but almost everybody here in the industry works together to push forward uh, what everyone else is doing. It's the whole concept of uh, raising the water level in all boats, therefore, are raised at the same time. That's what we did with Pinot Noir with early on with the International Pinot Noir Celebration. Oregon Pinot Camp was kind of an extension of that same, let's bring people to Oregon to show people exactly why it's such a special place and makes such a special wine. After that, we focus on other varieties. Uh, we f focus on other extensions of the industry. So Chardonnay, Riesling, uh, the white, white wines here sometimes get lost, especially when people want to focus in on what's made historically, made Oregon well known and that's Pinot Noir, but it's the climate that makes Pinot Noir possible here uh, of a world-class nature. That same climate has the capability of making fantastic white wines too and that many times is lost on people, even people coming in to grow grapes here in the valley. They grow Pinot Noir and then they say white wines. Instead they should be saying Pinot Noir and white wines and the white wine should be Chardonnay and Riesling and Pinot Gris has had an ascendancy over the years, but I give you odds, Riesling and Chardonnay will eat Pinot Gris lunch over time. And other quirky white varieties all the way. Uh, some, some of our friends are doing Auxerrois, uh, Albarino, uh, Arnais. Those are the A varieties, I guess. And uh, we're doing Gruner Veltliner. There are a lot of different wines that people are playing with to extend. And all of this uh, keeps us dynamic. I had mentioned also some of the extensions that don't have to do with specific grape varieties. There's a lot of effort that goes into making certain people who help our industry, like our vineyard workers, that they are adequately cared for. And so things like Salud, people like Dick and Nancy Ponzi, and others have done a great job in um, promoting health care through that and there's a whole group of people over the last almost 20 years well, yeah, it is 20 years uh, that have helped that happen and that's a collaborative effort so a lot of collaborative efforts around and if if you take advantage of it then you need to give back do you um, do you feel that that's something that's um, nice too or? I, I think the collaboration in the Oregon industry is very unique. That there be collaboration is not unique, it's just the degree to which we push it, I think. We, many of us, especially in the old guard, see each other probably two or three or four times a week um, because we're in one meeting or another that's trying to promote the, uh, either varieties or technical understanding or or work that goes on beyond that. Uh, it is something that is almost part of our uh, DNA now, and I don't think anybody really 
can do as much of it as we do here. Part of it's the fact that we're here on a frontier and have been since the beginning. By nature, a cool cl climate, a cool viticultural climate, which is what we've got in the Lamb Valley, a cool climate is um, a very iffy proposition. What it means is that if you've got a perfect climate for one vintage, it may not be perfect the next. And so you're gonna get vintage differences. Some people equate that to some good quality, yes. Some bad quality, no. And what we've learned is, of course, it isn't good and bad. It ends up being interesting. So we can have equivalently good wines that have different characteristics. And that's, that's what we have. Uh, that said, uh, we are on a frontier. All of us who have been here, especially from the beginning, know that in a frontier setting, you depend on each other a lot. It's just like my first vintage in the facility we're sitting in right now, 1995, bringing in equipment from Europe and not realizing that the electrical systems uh, needed changing not only as far as the plug-in but some of the other guts of my new press that I had gotten from Europe uh, and the person who came over to help me out of my problem was Dick Erath. He didn't have to do that. He was, uh, he was a friend but he also uh, had an interest in help and there are so many examples of that sort of stuff happening all around. I remember uh, uh, one of the vineyards I, or wineries that I worked with er, in early years uh, for, for a year or so at Harvest was uh, Myron Redford's Amity Vineyards and uh, the first time I'd seen and talked to Dick Ponzi at length was when Dick came over to help Myron understand what uh, his filter uh, was like, what made it work. Uh, Dick Ponzi, of course, being a mechanical engineer, used to design rides for Disneyland, uh, that sort of thing. He had an innate understanding of what was going on there. Myron, being uh, a philosophy major or something like that from the uh, U of Dub, had no idea of what the mechanical engineering side of things was, so we all helped uh, complement each other. I can remember many times uh, telling people about what they needed to do to run good trials inside their wineries, uh, emphasizing to people what the, the analytical methods were that they needed to be using inside their chem labs, that they actually needed to have a chem lab, that a pH meter is not a luxury, it's a necessity. So we all help out in the areas that we've got our, uh, our skill set. Well, one, one such area where um, kind of folks came together is around the, the Brooks Winery um, story and uh, when Jimmy Brooks passed away shortly before harvest. Um, what was that situation like? How were you involved in that harvest that year? Do you... uh, one of the sadder moments in my history here, one of them had to do with the death of my son. Uh, during uh, one harvest. The other uh, had to do with Jimmy Brooks passing away. Uh, he purchased fruit from, from me at one of our vineyards, actually the vineyard outside the winery here, Corral Creek. He, would, uh, he also made, uh, was beginning to make dynamite Riesling and Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir he purchased from us. We also were together in the initial stages of uh, a Riesling group, Riesling technical group. He was one of the prime movers as well as me in that group. So it was a huge loss initially. I, I know exactly, it's one of those things, you know where you were when Kennedy was shot, you know where you were when whatever. I know where I was when I heard that Jimmy Brooks had died that morning. I was on a trip back to Portland from an extended uh, uh, marketing trip and it was very crushing to realize that the person I had talked to three or four days 
or two or three days before leaving on this trip and as he was walking the vineyard to see what his grapes looked like this was right before harvest uh, that he was no longer with us and it it was uh, something that after the shock hit us and we allowed it to abate we realized Jimmy wasn't going to be able to make the wines that he wanted to make the Pinots and the and the Riesling and so four or five of us got together and said uh, let's offer to uh, those people remaining in Jimmy's life uh, and uh, obviously his son was the beneficiary of it but the person who was a prime mover who jumped up and uh, did magnificent work and still does to this day his sister Janie uh, and we offered to Janie the four or five of us we had gotten together uh, at one of our homes and just said okay Jimmy was gonna make wine now what was he gonna make who, who was he buying it from uh, and so several of us said let's make it for uh, for Jimmy he'd want us to do this and so so we did both that year and then several of us uh, the subsequent year and if I'm not mistaken we did a third year also and then finally they got uh, uh, got all of the fruit taken to another central location and uh, the Brooks line because of Janie uh, was continued but it, it did take two or three years for us to uh, to make certain that it was still on stable stable ground and uh, I don't think the wine suffered any for it uh, definitely our lives suffered for not having Jimmy around why, why was it so important to you um, to carry on his his winemaking and his style of uh, and his, kind of his goals for winemaking it was important that Jimmy not be forgotten. It was important because Jimmy was a passionate, I'm in it because I want to make fantastic wine and uh, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to, uh, uh, to take this passion and I'm going to listen to people. I'm going to work with other people. He was a team player along with the rest of us. Uh, the way you make up for a team player being lost from the team is the team pulling around that hole and making certain that uh, whatever game you're playing that you don't lose, that, uh, that we all suck it up and uh, do better for him and for that loss. Now um, Jimmy passed away? A little bit. Um, we had had dinner together with Jimmy. Uh, once or twice, uh, and uh, and yet she lived in California, and uh, so was not around very much. But knew knew Jimmy well enough to know what was going on. Uh, and to be honest, I I think I think uh, Janie didn't know that she was going to be as active as she has subsequently been over the last seven eight years. When. Um when she first got involved with the industry, uh, she obviously didn't know much about the wine industry. Did you, um, what did you do? Did you think that she would be able to be successful? Uh, I knew she was bright and I knew that she could handle the business side of things. She uh, was strong from a business sense. The one thing that several of us wanted to make sure she realized was what uh, the winemaking and grape growing side entailed. And so we, we actually did have uh, a time or two sitting down with her, usually at dinner or something, going through uh, what was important, uh, making certain she realized that for the wines that we all individually made in our own facilities, uh, how we made them, why we made them a certain way, what was critical. And she was also, uh, she is very bright and she knew well enough that there needed to be somebody focused on making the wines, not her, uh, and have it not be herself. And so Chris Williams was brought in as, uh, since he had been Jimmy's assistant winemaker in his uh, other winemaking roles at uh, 
Jimmy had initially been an assistant winemaker at Willa Kenzie, and then after that, he moved to winemaker status at May Sarah, and Chris, uh, Chris was his uh, assistant there. And Chris has done a good job in, in maintaining the view of what Brooks wine should be. If you um, have some of Brooks wines today, can you still get a sense of kind of the style and, and the goals that Jimmy was going for? Do you think that's been retained in the I, wines they're making? I think the Brooks wines today pretty much embody uh, the direction that Jimmy was going in. At the same time, we never know, I think, especially especially when you're you're going in a direction and you're you're adapting to vintages and you're also learning more and more about what you want to do uh, it's now what Janie and Chris want to do as much about uh, as it is about what Jimmy started and what trajectory Yeah. And what trajectory uh, he had sent the winemaking style in. And I'm not sure it should uh, necessarily uh, be limited to just what Jimmy had started. I, I think it needs to have its own progression. It needs to move organically from one thing to another. Some of the principles, however, that Jimmy had started have definitely been adhered to. Things like biodynamic um, viticulture. He was, he and I had some impassioned discussions about that because I personally uh, think that biodynamics rests somewhat tenuously on technical points and is too much a mystical, has too much mystical, uh, I'm going to go do biodynamics instead of going to church this week, sort of side to it. And so we would have these discussions back and forth. And to their credit, Janie and uh, the people working for her have maintained the, that biodynamic approach that Jimmy wanted and more power to them. So Ed, you're very uh, much uh, passionate it seems like about sustainable uh, sustainability in the vineyards and you know, things like dry farming or, or kind of salmon safe and all of those things so why is that important to you and then um, how is that different from biodynamics even maybe if you were going to compare the two um, uh, sus sustainability is important to the planet period and I definitely believe in us transitioning uh, more and more away from the unsustainable petrochemical uh, damage that's done by, uh, by sprays out in the vineyards to less uh, fuel-based uh, transport. Uh, we, we've done some ridiculous things as an industry uh, that only in retrospect seem as ridiculous as they were. Things like going to 800 to 900 gram empty bottles just to make them look like they're serious wines. Whereas when you move away from a heavy bottle to one that is much lighter, still does the job, still holds the wine, and yet is 450 grams or something like that, you save a hell of a lot of uh, carbon footprint. You have a lighter carbon footprint, you save a lot of oil, you save other things. Those sort of common sense as opposed to marketing schmaltz, uh, that's important to me. Uh, it's also important to avoid the, the more this is so romantic uh, that side of things, that's where I put biodynamics. Biodynamics has some great parts of it. It gets somebody who's growing grapes intimately involved in how the grapes are grown and in always being out in the vineyard. That's positive. 
when it starts tying things to astrological signs and where the planets are and things like that, that and, uh, and religious adherence to certain timings and things like that and burying uh, cow horns with dung in them, that sort of thing, that's going too far. Uh, there, there is a, a, an insistence on not having to prove technically it, that it makes any difference. And I basically was raised in a, at a time which I think is still a very positive um, characteristic, a time where uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. And if we, don't, uh, if we don't prove things from a scientific aspect or have the capability of doing it, then it's something that should be relegated to church services on Sunday. And that's where biodynamics fits in as far as I'm concerned. Like the positive aspects of it, I totally uh, am a non-adherent to any of the uh, more mystical sides of things. And um, so in your conversations or dis disagreements and friendly arguments with Jimmy, do you, um, did you get pretty impassioned at times about, uh, about your two sides of it or did you have some in-depth discussions? Uh, Jimmy and I had, Jimmy and I definitely had some impassioned discussions about things. Jimmy always was impassioned about things that uh, that he had an opinion on, and I was too. I don't think he moved me, and I didn't move him. Uh, he and I had a great relationship in that uh, we uh, we always started friendly, we always ended friendly, and patting each other on the back and giving each other advice. Uh, and in between, we could uh, also hit points where we're saying that's bullshit, and it's good to have friends that way. That's almost the definition of a friend: is somebody who's willing to say bullshit. And uh, how is he um, regarded in the community? One one thing in speaking with Janie is she really had he'd been kind of a wanderer and, and tried a lot of different things in his life, and she thought wine was just another one of those things, and he'd go on to something else, but. She was really surprised to find, when she came up the day he died, all of the people that came together at his house and the number of people at the funeral and things like that. She yeah. just had no idea of that. So how was he regarded in the community? Uh, Jimmy was regarded as somebody who was ultimately very passionate about wine. He, I think, had found what he had been wandering around looking for. He also was uh, just as impassioned uh, about food, you know, about discovering other aspects. He, he would be very much today uh, continuing to look at new restaurants in Portland and uh, kind of supporting the, the new spill out of restaurants out here in wine country. He'd be involved in the uh, in the alcohols that are now being made exceptionally well in the area. As a matter of fact, one or two of his good friends had just begun what they were doing and they're exceptionally well known now in that field. Um, we all got together uh, to make certain that Jimmy wasn't forgotten uh, and we realized that he wouldn't have ever been forgotten it, there was a huge outpouring. There, was, there were a lot of people who didn't necessarily know that the other people knew Jimmy as well as they did, etc. We, uh, I actually, for the service out in the vineyard, which was well laid out, and, um, Jimmy and, uh, and Don, his girlfriend at the time, uh, they made certain that the services were well um, well laid out with Jimmy in mind. I actually led the service that day uh, which I, I was very thankful of. Um, uh, Sam Tannehill and Cheryl Francis who were very close friends of Jimmy's uh, uh, helped to lay things out and they recommended that I could should take the lead on that, which was uh, which was great to to experience and see this sea of faces out there, 
all of them with tears in their eyes, but at the same time wanting to say uh, thanks for being around as long as you were, Julie. Was that a, a, a difficult task, I mean, to get up in front of the folks and speak about Jimmy? It's a, it's, it's a difficult task, uh, but it's something that you want to do. It's, again, that you have to give of yourself. And, uh, and I, I'm enough of, a, um, of an introvert to where all I do is try to turn myself into someone totally different and then I can get up there and still impassioned but at the same time um, appreciating what needed to be done. Uh, I, I just flicked the switch and became not a friend of Jimmy but someone who was trying to translate that passion that everybody had uh, and uh, the friendship that everybody had trying to translate that into a meaningful uh, service. It worked. Janie kind of describes the scene when she came up from California that day and, and seeing a group of people, I think at Jimmy's house, who gathered. Um, I'm trying to recall the details, but do you, do you recall kind of first meeting her that, that day when she came up from California? Uh, I remember there were several gatherings over the two or three days prior to the service. Uh, one of them was in Sam and Cheryl's house in McMinnville. Uh, I think there was a gathering at Jimmy's house there in McMinnville also. But there were two or three times when we all got together to uh, try to plan out things, including uh, Harvest, which was on us very soon after that. And so we were, uh, especially the nucleus of people who were taking wines and, or taking grapes and making wine into them out of them for, for Jimmy. I think that was a critical part of us getting together. And um, how did, in the mix of all of that, do you think that was helpful to Janie to have those things to focus on? And, and I think so, yes. I, I think you want to think about the future uh, rather than to um, be as sad as you you want to be at a time like that about the past and the fact that the past is no longer going to, uh, uh, with Jimmy, is no longer going to extrapolate into the future. Uh, I, I think you need to think about other future-oriented things. And I, I, I think uh, keeping Jimmy alive with the Brooks brand, um, it does help his son. He's going to have whatever equity there is in that, uh, thanks to Janie going forward, but I think we all feel better for it too, knowing that uh, Jimmy's vision is, uh, is still there. And early on, Pascal had said that he wanted to get into the wine business and spoke with him recently. Now he's a 16-year-old, so uh, all of a sudden being the head of a business is <laughs> It's a, a lot, it looks a lot different when you want to be young and wander around and do different things, but um, do you recall him as a young uh, kid hanging out with Jimmy and being involved in the vineyards? And, and uh, I, I don't necessarily recall a lot of that. I know that he and, uh, he and his dad definitely walked the vineyards some. I know here at Crow Creek they were out there uh, walking together. He, Jimmy was always very proud when he was with Pascal. I would bump into him at coffee shops in Portland or something and Pascal would be with him and it was, uh, uh, it was always great high-fiving and doing things that way. Uh, he, uh, he definitely shouldn't be burdened by the, the Brooks brand. It should be an option for him. So I, I hope that he isn't trying to make a decision that he's, he's got to be uh, sooner rather than later involved in it. He needs to have uh, his teenage years, he needs to have college, he needs to do what Jimmy did, he needs to maybe even uh, uh, follow Jimmy's path to, uh, to Eastern Europe and places like that. He needs to find out himself before he uh, knuckles down and tries to 
make the Brooks brand his because it doesn't have to be. It's uh, Jimmy's vision that was maintained there and if, if Pascal wants to be a part of that, great, but it shouldn't be a burden to him. He shouldn't be expected to do that. So um, it, how did you approach that with your own daughter in terms of um, the business and, and her kind of following you into the business? That's a great question. Uh, I did it the same way that I would recommend that uh, Janie and Pascal's mom do it with Pascal. Uh, I always let her know that this is a family business if you want it to be a family business, that you don't have to, and I'm not going to uh, make you feel guilty in order for you to be involved. It's always an option for you. And I think she, she took me at my word, and so uh, for four years she had two two-year jobs in research after she got her chemistry degree from Bryn Mawr and uh, worked uh, to where she knew what those industries were like and she realized what the uh, workaday world was like and she had worked enough harvest uh, and had friends who were getting involved with us out here also. There were one or two good friends of hers, her roommate and then her best friend at, uh, at university all worked full harvests for us just because they didn't know what to do uh, after school and uh, that was great. She realized, I think, through them and also through her years that it was something that she knew a lot about that she had the technical capability and after a while I think had gotten into wine enough to understand the magic of wine and especially wine from an area like this. So she, uh, she indicated that she wanted to get back in the business. I, I uh, gave her my advice as to how best to do it and luckily some of my friends who she considered friends also gave her the advice go back to school, you can be great as you are now, but go ahead and get some additional um, learning, go back, uh, and she, she did go to UC Davis, got her master's in enology and viticulture, then worked harvest, uh, three or four harvests in places like New Zealand, two or three of them there, and Burgundy, she got a, um, a, a stipend and a fellowship to go in work harvest in Burgundy, an extended harvest period there, and that was helpful. Then she came back and began as an assistant winemaker here, and as it turns out, her roommate uh, during university was, uh, was a uh, woman who eventually came out, worked harvest, and fell in love with my assistant winemaker at the time who then became a co-winemaker with me several years later and they were married they now have two kids and within the last week have gone back to new zealand he was a kiwi or is a key after spending 11 years working harvests and being my co-winemaker here the last five or six years so uh, all kinds of all kinds of integration of people's lives and so she actually took the baton from from Mike who was my co-winemaker uh, and said goodbye to a good friend at the same time so she is now co-winemaker with me here at Shehalem. And um, is it kind of give you some satisfaction and pride to see her being able to kind of step in and, and help run things at a level that um, you'd trust her with, with head winemaker? Uh, Wynn has earned every single bit of trust that she has from everybody around her. And uh, it is, it's great to see both her being very interested and very talented in the field. Um, it's also a validation, I think, and this, this I think goes for anybody in the industry who was in wave one or two or three to see 
the second generation come in and say, I want to be a part of it and take the baton and go forward. So it's, uh, it's rewarding that she's my daughter doing as well as she is. It's doubly rewarding that she sees uh, the beauty and, uh, and the need to be a part of this industry that uh, we all began. It's, it's the ultimate validation that we in the industry have. And there are a lot of people who I'm sure you've talked to who are in that uh, process of either having handed off or getting ready to hand off to the second generation. Well, you you uh, mentioned your son passed away just prior to a harvest. Was he um, pretty involved in the business or have interest in the business? Uh, at that time? Uh, my, my son was 19 when he was killed in an auto accident. Happened to be at harvest time. He was going to run an errand for us and actually died on the highway outside in front of the, the winery. Uh, and that was obviously a disastrous time. Um, he had not been involved uh, except as a kid getting involved in things along the way. He'd made his own line at one point as part of his uh, a, a technical school uh, project. Uh, he, uh, he was in architecture school at U of O, and so he was years away from being involved here. Is that, um, was that prior, or what, what year kind of in the, uh, he, he died in 1996. Mm -hmm. so. right, right about at the time that you were kind of taking to the business full time and a lot of things. Yes, exactly. And that was, that was actually one of the, one of the, the, uh, one of the things that convinced me that uh, I should uh, back off on trying to do everything that, uh, there needed to be a lot more attention at home and uh, in trying to cope with that. So that was definitely a big part of it. There were one or two other things happening at the same time that gave me a push towards going 100% in vineyard and winery. Well, I had always been 100%, but just not spending 100% of my time. And, and now having focused on that more for, uh, you know, for the next 10 or 12 years um, since that time, um, is it where you'd hoped it would be and was that kind of decision to go into it full time, has it changed where you might have been had you not gotten more involved or more well, uh, can Candidly, I couldn't have gone any longer spending 100% of the time that was required for winery and vineyard work and doing something else also it was just impossible. And, uh, and the business has definitely been fruitful and definitely rewarded that amount of attention. I think uh, our brand and the wines that we make couldn't be more highly regarded. And uh, I, I'm very proud of what we've done. Um, would I be able to do that in a part-time effort? So, what when you started in 1980? Um, do you have just a roughly? I don't know how many wineries there might have been in Oregon at that time, but probably not a whole lot. Um, I, I do have the the listing of the wineries and the number of wineries and vineyards that were in existence then. I can't remember them right this second, but suffice it to say, it was maybe 1,200 acres of vines compared to today's 20-some thousand. And I think there were maybe 40 wine brands, something like that. Now there are 525. Like that. So people are, it's expanding, it's growing. People are flocking to the industry in Oregon. Um, what advice might you have to these folks that are starting new brands and starting new wineries and looking to get involved in the industry? My advice to people starting out is to look for advice, take advice, 
uh, you don't have to do what the advice says, but you're always a lot more comfortable making decisions if you've got a lot of data at hand. Ooh, data, sounding technical again. But it's, it's more even, uh, even anecdotal information from people who've been through the wars helps a lot. We, within the industry, do a lot of mentoring. Uh, I can't count the number of people who are still in the industry who've come through, worked harvest, or begun their winemaking here in our facility. Um, a lot of names that you would recognize have, uh, have come through our doors and then add to that those who have gone and been mentored by other people. I, I think that's part of the process, that's part of the collaboration. It's part, of, part that, uh, that I think we who are still in it and still love the business is part of what we want to give to others. We want to be good mentors. So um, do you think that with this increase in the number of wineries and this, the expansion that um, Oregon kind of is at a risk of losing some of that collaboration and camaraderie or do you think that's going to be a persistent part of the, you know, kind of style of Oregon winemaking going forward? I, I think the flavor of of Oregon's winemaking community is still the same as it was. Is it different in other characteristics? Yes. But I think people understand the worth of collaboration and even if they don't when they first enter the, the industry, very soon afterwards they understand it. They get involved, they get pulled in by people who say, oh yeah, well, uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to do this, why don't you go talk to so-and-so, or why don't you become a part of this group? Uh, we end up beating the bushes to, uh, to know who's wanting to make Riesling of very high quality out there, just to uh, make certain that we can give the technical advice or the marketing advice, and to make certain that we all are learning from each other. Uh, the same as uh, the raising the water level raises all boats. Uh, if you somehow uh, knock a hole in the dam and you drain the water, uh, then that hurts all boats. We all sink together. So we, we all have a vested interest in making sure each one of us makes the best wines possible. Other kind of thoughts or vision for Oregon's just wine industry in terms of getting recognition and competing with other regions and, and you know, fitting into a future of, mm -hmm. for wine drinkers, do you? I, I think Oregon, to continue what has begun. I think Oregon needs to remember several tenets. One is the whole whole idea of collaboration, making certain we're a community pushing forward. Another critical thing is that we trust ourselves and know enough to where we don't compare ourselves with other regions outright in order to pull ourselves up by comparison to them. Uh, comparisons to Burgundy or trying to push down the, uh, the reputation of California in order for us to look better is no way of doing business. We have to feel confident in our own abilities to where we're talking about Oregon. Uh, we aren't talking about Oregon versus Burgundy or versus California we are who we are and what we're finding more and more is that the characteristics of Oregon wines are Oregon. Uh, they aren't, uh, this is a Burgundian Pinot Noir or a Burgundian Chardonnay. We are Oregon Pinot Noir and Oregon Chardonnay. And that, that I think is one thing that we many times have to uh, remind people of. We've gone beyond having to compare ourselves to others. And uh, do you think people are starting to recognize that also out in the, you know, 
influ influencers, the sommeliers and the writers and that, do you think you're starting to penetrate that? Uh... I, I think there's a great deal of sophistication being gained all, all throughout the marketplace. The, uh, the American consumer, the people who sell the American consumer wines, everybody's becoming more sophisticated. And what that means is that as you know more about wines, you know that you don't have to be hit between the eyes with something that just is dramatic. That the more you know about wine, the more you look for complexity, for elegance, for things that require insight. And that is a cool climate. And that's what we have here in the Willamette Valley. It's all about nuance, it's about complexity, it's about each vintage being slightly different and you exulting in it rather than worrying about it. So it's, it's critical whether we're talking Pinot Noir or whether we're talking white wines, we need to understand that those wines that we make are sophisticated, elegant, complex wines that people will be growing into as they learn more and more about wine. Oh, great. In Oregon, we are so out of proportion in uh, the reputation that's out there in the international marketplace. I mean, we, we have one or two percent of American wine, yeah. and uh, we're probably uh, 30 or 40 percent of the press and reviews and general knowledge out there. That's, um yeah, it's pretty spectacular when you think about it. I've heard, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but the Gallo crushes more fruit in, One in its biggest weekend than the entire state of Oregon during an entire season. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I think that's true. And uh, so Yeah, I think there was a facility built maybe 10 years ago or so that was going to, would be able to process all of the fruit uh, in in Oregon, and I don't even think that was a gallo winery. I think it was wow. somebody else. Well, it's, um, and then you see the size of the scale of the operations, it's just here that are larger, it's mm -hmm. hard to fathom how much bigger it could be. But yeah. 